So what was all that Easter business about? I mean, you've kind of sat through it here, all the saints, haven't you? You know, we've done Lent. We've done Maundy Thursday. Who was here for the Maundy Thursday meal? It was fantastic and real eye-opener for me. Good Friday, who was down the hill there, walking? Yeah, Nigel comes to all of them. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we had Easter Day. Um, so, why did Jesus have to die? What's its significance? And more importantly, can you explain it to a friend or stranger? And does God really love me? So let's just run through Jesus' last week. Um, so there was the Jewish trial on, um, on the Thursday night, which was unusual. Uh, and then Friday was very early. Was, it must have got up about 7 o'clock or something like that, as soon as daybreak, and whipped him over to, to Pilate's place and said, this guy's got to die. Um, and then by nine o'clock, Jesus was actually on the cross. So it's an awful lot packed into that first few hours. Um, and then at three o'clock, darkness comes over the land. Um, well, so at noon, darkness comes over, and then he dies at three o'clock. And a really, really important thing at that moment is that the curtain is torn from top to bottom, bottom in the temple, revealing the Holy of Holies, that bit that people weren't allowed to see. So, so God is saying, the debt for all your sin, the thing which separated us, has been paid at that moment. You could argue we don't actually need the resurrection because God's already said it in that temple curtain. But of course, Jesus had more work to do, and it is the proof. So there was a hurried burial and preparation for the Sabbath. Everyone had to rest on the Sabbath. Um, Sunday's the first day of the week, and the Sabbath had held Cleopas in Jerusalem because Emmaus was too far away to go for a Sabbath day's walk, which is a short distance. Um, and then as, as he kind of gets up, bits of news come, start coming in. The women come back from the, had a vision of angels. We thought they were talking nonsense. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's where we'd got to. So then they set off. Cleopas then sets off sort of probably mid-afternoon. Um, and they were kept from recognizing him. Um, now we have different views, Pippa and I, about this. You see, she says it's totally God making them not be able to recognize him. Jesus must have looked different and sounded look different. But equally, he's got a beard, he's got his hoodie. Their faces are down. Um, so, I don't know who's seen Undercover Boss. It's when the boss comes and sits in with some of his staff. I don't know him. But it put me in mind of when I, I for 25 years, I've been a traveling salesman and you have all these amazing training meetings in fancy hotels. Uh, and then the boss says, I want to come out with you tomorrow. I see you're going to be in Swindon. And he wants to know, were you at the training? Did you hear it? Did you see it? Did you understand it? And can you now talk about it to other people? Because that's what we've paid you, you know. Um, and so there he is, he's the undercover boss. Um, and then there's this lovely training of who's a dummy. Surely you must have heard. <laughs> uh, how foolish and slow you are to believe. 
Because it, it just seems a little bit harsh, doesn't it, when Jesus says, how foolish you are. But it's, it's, I think it's just a little bit of um, badinage. Anyway. So then Jesus goes through the prophets to illustrate what sort of Messiah um, he is and not what they'd expected. If you listen to Zechariah's prayer, it's about save us from our enemies. So immediately you're thinking Romans, and I think that was probably what everyone thought. So let's just see how, um, how that works out. Um, do you remember one account of the feeding of 5,000? Jesus could sense that the crowd wanted to come and take him by force to be king. Um, And this is the sort of king Jesus had wanted, wanted, wanted them to understand. Um, God so loved the world, and this is, this is the core of the whole of the Easter story. God so loves you. Simon Flint used to say, Jesus loves you with every beat of his heart. That he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So now, all saints, we have a prophet's competition just to see how, um, how much we know. Okay. Where do you think we're going with this one? Which prophet might have talked about a um, foal of an ass? Who said that? Zechariah, of man. Um, it's also interesting that when Solomon was, was crowned king, his, he borrowed his dad's donkey, which is a thousand years ago. Zechariah is uh, 400 years earlier. Um, and of course, we, rem we remember Palm Sunday. Um, so then we've got this one. Which prophecy do you think this is? Who, who do you think might be? We just had it. <laughs> Robin. In that fantastic description of absolutely everything about the crucifixion. It was Isaiah, wasn't it? And it was page 700, 700 years earlier. Um, and where are we? There he is. Now, this one's a giveaway because here is Moses and the snakes. So the people grumbling, <laughs> as they did, out, out in the desert. And um, snakes came and started biting them. The snake represents who in the Bible? The devil, yeah. Um, and so Moses was told, make a bronze snake. We'll stick it on a stick. And anyone who looks at it, and recognizes that this is God's solution to their problem of being bitten by a snake, um, they won't die. Now, Jesus himself quotes this one then. Um, when he's talking to Nicodemus, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. What's the link between Jesus and the snake? Sin. So when Jesus goes on the cross, it's like Satan himself is nailed to the cross in the form of Jesus. That's really... That's hardcore, isn't it? And that's why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's try another one. Psalm, correct, 22. They divide my clothing among them and 
this is actually rather, it's rather touching because the soldiers who crucified Jesus and took all his gear, and when they came to the, the tunic that Mary had woven without a seam, they recognized it as a fine piece of, hand, of, of handcraft, handicraft, made lovingly by Mary for Jesus. So they said, we won't, we won't damage it. Um, and of course, she's there weeping. Then later on into the story, which profits this. That's what happened in, in, in the, when Judas, yeah, I'll, I'll, let's move on to it. This is another Zechariah prophecy, um, and I'll read it out. And the Lord said to me, throw the money to the potter, the handsome price at which they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. So the potter's field must have been close to the temple. And there's kind of two, two kind of bits on this. One, one, one gospel says that um, Judas threw the money down in the, in the temple, sorry, um, and then went off and hanged himself. Another gospel says and Judas went to the potter's field and he fell in the hole because they'll have been taking clay out of it for hundreds of years, well, at least 400. Um, so there'd been a big hole and died horribly. So this was blood money, and so this foretells what Judas was going to do. Do cup, one more. So what, what sort of Messiah were people expecting? And it wasn't the sort that they were expecting when they tried to make him king. It was not one, he was not one, he would not redeem, redeem Israel by force all at one time. Not Peter with his sword chopping off ears. Dear Pilate, please go and we'll chop off your ears. No, no this, was, this was not the sort of Messiah that, that Jesus was. He is the Passover lamb to take away our sin, the king of heaven. And he would redeem Israel and the world one at a time. Personally, with love, forgiveness and adoption into his family. Who was the real enemy? Was it the Romans? Or was it the sin in our own lives? Which separates us from God. And I think that's kind of where, where we are with, with talking to people. It's, where, is it, where are you? Do you need saving from the Romans or is it <laughs> something else? Um, so, just finishing off then. Can you explain this to a friend without using jargon? God loves you and wants you to have your best life. Your best life. That's a, a phrase we hear all the time, isn't it? Um, then there's the Alpha Course. The Alpha Course has got a whole session on why Jesus had to die. And then there's John 3.16, which we had a little bit earlier. And the scripture that Paul, when Paul's writing about um, himself, and I can resist everything except temptation, I know what I should do, but I keep doing the very opposite who can save me from this body that's trying to kill me? Um, and Jesus came to take one for the team. It's like he's a scapegoat. These are, t these are terms in common use, aren't they? Are, are these helpful to put into conversations? John 13, 13. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. 
And we see examples of self-sacrifice in the news kind of every day. So that was kind of going through the prophets with the chap. They finally fetch up at Emmaus. And um, what do they do? Well, they're hungry. So um, it's, it's still Passover, so we're eating flatbread for a week. He was, how do you think he did this? <laughs> this is my body. Right, Cleopas, friend? It was made known to them by the way he broke bread. And of course the other final great thing is he has risen. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Thank you.